OFA. It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. You know, um, the question to the Premier, uh, Speaker. Premier, I was uh, talking to a young man, uh, my riding name, Justin. Justin wants to be an electrician. He's finishing off high school at E.L. Crosley, and he wants to get in the trades. But he has asked me, why do the Kathleen Wynne Liberals and the NDP uh, stand in his way getting a good job in the trades? The Ontario College of Trades is locked in outdated apprenticeship ratios. They limit opportunities, and they're going to charge him a new tax. You know, if I could do anything, I want to create a million jobs in our province. I want to see Justin achieve his dream of being an electrician in the province of Ontario. My question to you, Premier, is why are you standing in the way of Justin getting a good job in the skilled trades? Uh, before I go to the Premier, a reminder that we re refer to each other either by our title, specifically our title, and um, the writings. I appreciate very much your cooperation. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and we very much want Justin to have the opportunity to uh, develop a skilled trade. And I want to thank I want to thank David Tabucci, who has taken on a leadership role with the College of Trades, Mr. Speaker. And what the College of Trades is about, Mr. Speaker, is making sure that people in the skilled trades, people who work in the skilled trades, have decision-making power over what matters to them, Mr. Speaker. That is the professionalism that we had wanted to put in place, Mr. Speaker. That's what the College of Trades is about. So I very much hope that Justin, whether he has taken part in a specialist high skills major, which is a, a program that we have put into our high schools, Mr. Speaker, whether he is uh, uh, looking at getting into an apprenticeship at this point in his career, whether he had the opportunity to, uh, to take part in a, a pre-apprenticeship program in high school. Answer. There are many paths to, uh, to a skilled trade, Mr. Speaker. The College of Trades puts that professionalism framework around that, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, for such my point, Premier, I mean, um, Justin can't find an apprenticeship position because you're, quite frankly, um, in the pockets of the special interests, including Pat Dillon, who um, runs a Liberal negative ad. Withdraw, please. Withdraw. Uh, withdraw, Speaker. You um, clearly, Premier, would rather listen to Pat Dillon, who runs the Liberal negative ad campaign, where I'm on the side of job creators and the young people who want to get into the skilled trades. You know, a show I um, loved watching is going to university in the late 80s, St. Elsewhere. Grey's Anatomy, a popular one today. And you don't see a flock of doctors around one intern going from patient to patient. You see a flock of interns learning from one doctor. Last time I checked, doctors care very much about public safety. All I'm asking is go to one-to-one -one ratio, a mentor Question. to apprenticeship ratio like other provinces, including NDP Manitoba will do. That'll get Justin to work great 200,000 jobs in the scale of trade. That's what I'll Why not you? I'm, uh, I'm uh, quite prepared. I'm still standing. I'm quite prepared. I am quite prepared to get attention here, but the difficulty is I'm still hearing heckling when the question is being put from the same side, as I'm trying to get attention to the other side when the answers are given. My tolerance level will not be very high today. Carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the screenwriters, we'll come the screenwriters for Grey's Anatomy are not the people who develop our policy, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. That may be how the leader of the opposition develops his policy, but that's not how we do it. And if the leader of the opposition, if the leader, leader of the opposition imagines that a doctor training or a nurse or a teacher, Mr. Speaker, has one mentor throughout his training or her training, Mr. Speaker, then that just is evidence that the uh, leader of the opposition really doesn't understand. How how training works, Mr. Speaker, and how people learn a, a trade or a skill or a profession, Mr. Speaker. It takes many people to work with uh, a professional, Mr. Speaker, and that is the reality. So we have put the College of Trades in place. We're very grateful to the people who've taken a leadership role there. We want people yes, in the sir. skilled trades to have control over the important decisions in their professions, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, no, we know who writes your script. It's Pat Dillon, the Working <laughs> Families Coalition. <laughs> on, 
honest, honest to goodness, Premier, it's almost, it's almost word for word. So let me tell you where I get my advice from, and I'll help Justin and 200,000 people like him get good apprenticeship jobs and skilled trades. I see what liberal British Columbia does. I see what progressive conservative Alberta does. I even see what NDP Manitoba does. And you know what? I hear from employers, I hear it from young workers, and I hear it from Garfield Dunlop, who lives and breathes and walks, walks I mean, Quite frankly, Garfield Dunlop has probably forgotten more about the skilled trades than you and I would ever know combined. I think I've got the facts on my side. I've got jobs on my side. I'm on the side Question. of young people to get jobs in the skilled trades. Of new Canadians who want to put those skills to work in the province of Ontario, why are you standing in their way? Why are you against 200,000 new jobs? Thank you. Premier. Training colleges and universities. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you who's standing in the way of progress and modernization of the skilled trades. It's the leader of the opposition. I'll tell you who's standing in the way of $185 million we're investing every year in the skilled trades and apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship programs. It's that leader of the opposition who doesn't support those investments. Remember I'll tell you who's standing in the order. way of jobs in the skilled trades, like the $33 billion we're investing in, uh, in infrastructure across this province. It's that leader of the opposition who refuses to support those, um, those investments. I'll tell you who's standing in the way of apprentices, Mr. Speaker, across this province. It's a leader of the opposition who wants the power to be able to dictate Remember decisions from in the skilled trades, rather order. than have the confidence in the people in the skilled trades, Mr. Speaker, to make those decisions. Thank you. Stop the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member from Chatham, Kent Essex, will come to order. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. To the, um, back to the Premier. Um, Premier, I, I don't think I've ever seen such a, a broad-based coalition that says we should eliminate the College of Trades so we can get people to work in the province of Ontario. Uh, just yesterday, the Labourers International Union, the, in fact, the largest construction union in the entire province of Ontario, uh, agrees with us. They stand against compulsory certification for carpenters. Minister, and, and look, if, if you're a union leader that's, that's pro-jobs or pro-opportunity, I stand with you. But if you're a union leader who's against jobs, wants to restrict supply and pad their own pockets, I'm not on your side. I'm on the side of jobs and opportunity. I stand with the Labour's International Union. I stand with the small businesses. I stand with the young people who want to get in the skilled trades. And I stand with new Canadians who find that you're imposing a thick wall between them and a good middle-class job. I'm clear where I stand. Opportunity, hope, good jobs. Why, Premier, do you stand with a special interest? Question, thank you. Premier. Much, Mr. Speaker. You know, the, the plan that we are putting in place is a plan to bring jobs to this province, That's Mr. Right. Speaker. It's a job, it's a, it's a plan that, that points to opportunity and security, Mr. Speaker. So if we look at what's uh, happened over the, the last few days an increase of 13,400 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, an employment rate that has fallen to 7.3%. It's fallen, Mr. Speaker. Um, Thursday, we announced revised deficit targets. We'll beat the uh, target by 400 million, Mr. Speaker. When Wednesday, uh, we tabled Ontario's long-term report uh, for the economic uh, um, health of the province, Mr. Speaker. We announced investment in coffee clubs that will support 400 more jobs, Mr. Speaker. So the work that we're doing on this side of the House is about creating that opportunity, moving forward, bringing jobs to the province, Mr. Speaker. And I understand that the leader of, of the opposition wants to make personal yes, attacks. He's naming people in the House. That's not how we're going to function, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you know, Premier, respectfully, the only plan you seem to have is an exit plan for young talent who are leaving our province to head out west. Uh, I want to see that young talent get a good job in Ontario, to, to buy a home, to be able to afford to pay a mortgage. And you know what? When you get a job in the skilled trades, you get a lot of experience, odds are you're going to start your own company down the road, hire more people. That's the kind of opportunity I want to see in Ontario. I'm desperate to see Ontario working again. You're standing in the way. The Labour's International Union, the coalition of job creators, young people, they're all saying, tear down this wall that stands in the way of getting good jobs in our province. 
The College of Trades has been an abject failure. Today is its one-year anniversary. This is your opportunity to hit the reset button, to say no to the special interests and yes to more Minister jobs. Minister Training Colleges University, will you come join to order. the Ontario PC Caucus, say no to College of Trades, and say yes to 200,000 good Question. apprenticeship jobs in the skilled trades? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Question, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, I just want to make sure that the leader of the opposition understands that the point of the call is to make sure we'll that to skilled order trades time. people are certified to do the work that they're performing. That's the essence of the College of Trades. Yeah. And it, it seems to me that it would be uh, a pretty uh, precarious position for the leader of the opposition to take that people shouldn't be. The member from Oxford will withdraw. Withdraw. That people shouldn't be trained to perform the skills that they are performing, the jobs that they're performing, Mr. Speaker. So that's the point. On the issue of compulsory certification, we believe that the decision to certify or decertify as a compulsory trade should be made by skilled people through the college. So that is the point. Answer. That is the point of the College of Trades, Mr. Speaker. And the leader of the opposition knows that ratios have been reviewed, Mr. Speaker, more than more than their government reviewed when they were in office. These are not decisions that should be made by politicians, but rather by skilled. Thank you. Final supplement. You know, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that the premier seems to exhibit such a patent uh, disregard for what the largest construction in the province has to say, Leuni. Basically, your suggestion is that they're not qualified to do their job. I mean, we're talking about 100,000 skilled construction professionals, and what you want to do with your compulsory certification is you want to take them off the job site. You want to tell people who pick up a hammer and a saw every day that they're not qualified to do the job in Liberal Ontario. You want them to go back to school. You want to close down the businesses. This is not only me saying this is the largest construction union in the province. And you know what? I take what Garfield Dunlop says any day. I take what Leuna says any day over somebody who's clearly captured by the special interests. I don't know why, Premier. You persist on this path of blocking the entryway into good middle class jobs. You won't listen to me. Will you listen to the largest construction union in the province? Thank say you. no to compulsory certification and say yes to more jobs. Premier. I'll just universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Let's talk about what the leader of the opposition stands for. He stands for right to work for less for every worker in this place. He stands, Mr. Speaker, for a party that denigrates the, the, the capacity of skilled trade workers to be able to govern themselves. Let me tell you what we stand for, Mr. Speaker. We believe in the capacity of skilled trade workers, just as, as 44 other professions govern themselves across this province. We believe that skilled trade workers are up to the job of governing themselves like nurses, like social workers, like doctors, like lawyers. It's too bad that the leader of the opposition doesn't have the confidence in our skilled trade workers that we do. He wants to make those decisions himself. He wants those decisions made like they have been for the last 30 years, Mr. Speaker, in smoky back rooms in the back rooms of Queen's Park. Answer. Mr. Speaker, we're for modernizing the skilled trades. We're for giving skilled trade workers the ability to do it themselves. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When the Premier took over the uh, Liberal Party, the Ontario Liberal Party, she said this, we are going to build on the legacy of Dalton. Does she still stand by that statement, Speaker? <laughs> Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, because because the work that we have done since 2003, Mr. Speaker, in our education system, in our health care system, in our health care system where wait times are down, Mr. Speaker, where we've got more home care in the system, Mr. Speaker, more doctors, more nurses, where kids are achieving more in school, Mr. Speaker, where we had 68 percent of kids graduating from school when we came into office. There are 83 percent of kids graduating from high school today, Mr. Speaker. I stand by that record absolutely every day. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, the Premier sat in Cabinet when decisions on the gas plants were made and signed off on those decisions. She had a leadership role in the campaign when the decision was made to cancel the Mississauga gas plant. Does she agree that those decisions are part of the so-called legacy of Dalton? Speaker, I have answered that question over and over and over again. I have said that there were decisions made that I had nothing to do with, Mr. Speaker. There were fundamental decisions made that I believe were not the right decisions, Mr. Speaker. I have said that. I have appeared before committee, and I have said that, Mr. Speaker. And I have worked since I came into this office to make sure that all of the information that has been asked for has been provided. The committee has had hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the committee knows that they have the uh, capacity to continue to uh, ask people to come before them, Mr. Speaker. We opened up the process, and we have moved to change the rules, Mr. Speaker, around yes, the siting of energy infrastructure, which was at the root of this challenge, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Speaker, how signing a cabinet document has nothing to do with the gas plant scandal is beyond me, but maybe this Premier can justify it. Last February, the Premier said about Dalton McGuinty the following, and I quote, I'm proud to have been part of his government, unquote. Now, the Premier has been at pains lately to avoid even saying the name Dalton McGuinty, despite serving as key part of his team for 10 years. He's now referred to as the former Premier. Can the Premier even say the words Dalton McGuinty, or does she think avoiding that name magically absolves her of all responsibility for the gas plant scandal? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I am very proud to have been part of a government that undid the, the real destruction that had been in place under the previous government. Mr. Speaker, I got involved in provincial politics because there was a government in place in this province from 1995 to 2003 that had no respect for our public institutions, Mr. Speaker, that undermined labour and that really changed the rules in terms of the, the supports for the citizens of this province. That's why I got involved in provincial politics. And the work that we have done, Mr. Speaker, is work that I am proud of. Were there decisions made that I think should have been different? Absolutely. And I have said that repeatedly. I have taken responsibility. I have apologized for decisions that were made. But, Mr. Speaker, Answer. we are moving forward. And I think that the leader of the third party, it would be, it would be a very helpful thing if she would talk to us about what, for example, her energy policy is. Mr. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. When did the Premier become aware that Premier's office computers had been wiped clean? Premier? Mr. Speaker, there is there's an OPP investigation going on. I, I am not I am not going to comment Remember on from here on Bruce come to order. And I have as I have said, the allegations that have been made as a result of that investigation are allegations corrected. against someone who did not work in my office, Mr. Speaker. So what we are doing on this side of the House is we are letting that we are letting that uh, investigation go on, Mr. Speaker, and we are very, very focused on putting in place the policies, the investments to make sure that we have prosperity in the future, Mr. Speaker, that there's security for the people in this province. That is what we are going to embed in our budget, Mr. Speaker, that we will be bringing forward. And I, you know, it would be very, very helpful if the leader yes, of the third party wanted to engage in any of those policy discussions, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. It would be helpful if the Premier answered my question, Speaker. Long after the Premier long after the Premier took charge of the Liberal Party, her government was dismissing concerns about key Liberal staff who said quite proudly that they routinely deleted emails. Now we know that unauthorized individuals the environment were roaming the order. halls. Now we know that unauthorized individuals were roaming the halls, tampering with staff's computers, yet the Premier still claims she's as shocked as anyone else. Can the Premier tell us how she can possibly not have known that this was happening? Well, Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. Speaker, the reason we are having this conversation, the reason that the leader of the third party is asking these questions is because we opened up the process, Mr. Speaker. I came into this office and I said we are going to ask the Order. Start the clock. Order. Finish, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I, I was very clear when I came into this office that those questions needed to be asked and answered, and so that is what has happened, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to cooperate. Obviously, uh, there's an investigation going on. We will let that go on. But, Mr. Speaker, we are very focused on making sure that we have a path forward, that we have a path forward Answer. to the opportunity and security, whether it's in education, whether it's in health care. And I'd be happy to talk with any of the members on the other side of the House about any of those issues Thank anytime. You. Final supplementary. Speaker, this Liberal Premier can try to rewrite history as much as she wants, but there's something called contempt that we all know occurred, and you can't erase that from history, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's Ontarians want to see, Speaker, a government that is accountable to the people who are stuck paying the bill for government spending. The Premier can try to rewrite history, Speaker, but people haven't forgotten that she was a key part of the team that steered us directly into this mess. Minister and all the, ducking, all the dodging and all the denials in the world, Speaker, are not going to change that. The Premier can start by answering some basic questions like, when exactly did she become aware that Premier's office computers had potentially Question. been wiped clean? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So there is an entirely independent investigation, police yes. investigation going on, yeah, Mr. Speaker, right. so I am not going to comment on that investigation. What I am going to say is that we made it clear that there were changes that needed to be made. Uh, we have worked to make those changes, Mr. Speaker. First of all, we opened up the process around the questions around the relocation of the gas plants. We opened up the scope of the committee, Mr. Speaker. We've changed the rules around the siting of energy infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We've changed the rules around the retention of documents, Mr. Speaker. We've made those changes in consultation with people like the Information Privacy Commissioner, Mr. Speaker. So that is work that we have done in order to make sure that these kinds of questions Answer. do not arise again, Mr. Speaker, because the decisions that are made will be made differently. I'm very proud of that work, Mr. Speaker. I'm also proud of the work that we're doing to bring forward a budget that is going to work to ensure security. Thank you. Stop the clock for a second. Uh, earlier, I had, uh, I had mentioned uh, 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 the member from Huron Bruce to come to order. I did not mean to say that Huron Bruce. I apologize. I meant to say Bruce Gray Owen Sound, who's working on his second one. New question. The, the member from Sim uh, Simcoe North. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to welcome all the people that are associated with the College of Trades and all the different tradespeople that are here today for this debate. Um, and my friend David Kibuchi as well. Thank you, David. My question today is for the Minister of Training, College and Universities. Minister, your latest tax grab and boondoggle, the Ontario College of Trades, is one year old today. As a communications and consultation nightmare, I don't think anything is more damaging than the fact that they are well on their way to the compulsory certification of the carpentry trade. I have asked you in this House to intervene on this decision, and you have ignored, and you have ignored me. Now the largest labour's union, Leuna, and I understand the member from Essex is actually a member of Leuna, has asked that you put a moratorium on any compulsory certification of construction trades. Yeah, if you're a proud member, you should have voted me the other day. Your, your time is up. Don't talk to him. Talk to me. Sit down. Your time is up. Minister of Training, Calls and Trade. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Somewhere, somewhere to his leader, the member seems to not be able to ask a question 
or make a comment on the College, college of Trades without, without tons of hyperbole, without information that's generally not correct. If you listen to the member in the last couple of weeks, he was saying 85,000 apprentices would be out of work April 8th. Well, guess what? It's April 8th. There's no apprentices out of work, sir. You're doing wrong. Your credibility is absolutely shot when it comes to these issues. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to, to working with the Ontario College of Trades as we all do. Some of the issues they're going to be dealing with are very challenging. They are going to have to take a very careful approach to these decisions. I'm very confident that they will. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sorry I put you along on that first question, but the supplementary, I know that Jack Oliviera, the business manager of Local 183 from Leona, says this will drive up costs and could put thousands of our members out of work. And people are lining up fighting this, Mr. Speaker. Now Federal Minister Jason Kenney has come out swinging against this idiotic proposal. Minister Kennedy, Kenney says a disaster decision like this warrants national attention. Order. Order. Look, I'm trying to get quiet over here. You're not helping. Everyone should be able to put a question and answer a question uninterrupted. Carry on, please. Minister Kennedy says, and I quote, there is a growing concern that while most provinces in Canada are looking at ways to remove barriers to entering the skilled trades. Ontario is heading in the opposite direction, the wrong direction. I ask you once again, Minister, to please immediately order a moratorium on any new compulsory Question. certification of trades. Will you do that, Minister? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, what is it about the arrogance of PC politicians to, to think that politicians know more about the skilled trades than skilled trades people themselves? We've seen how that's worked the last 20 years. Mr. Speaker, the member wants to get rid of the College of Trades just when it's getting up and running. For some reason, he thinks that skilled trades people aren't capable of making these important decisions affecting their professions. We think differently, Mr. Speaker. We have confidence in skilled trades people that they will work in, this, in the spirit of self-governance. We do not want to do what he wants to do. He wants to bring that administration back into government. That's what I call big government tax and spend politics, something that I find surprising coming from the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, we believe that the people in the skilled yes, trades will manage these issues very thoughtfully. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Has the Premier talked to Christy Clark since New Democrats wrote a letter to her so we could ensure Laura Miller, former Deputy Chief of Staff, could appear at the Justice Committee? Mr. Speaker, we had a chance to, uh, to deal with this issue yesterday. The fact of the matter is that the Justice Committee, which uh, uh, the Premier asked when she became Premier, be given very broad scope and uh, uh, extreme, uh, uh, extremely, I would say, broad powers in the sense that could sit at the call of the chair. They can uh, uh, direct their proceedings as they see fit, Mr. Speaker, and they have the power and the authority to invite uh, who they see fit to come and be witnesses. And certainly, Mr. Speaker, we respect the work of the committee and uh, we respect the fact that they have that opportunity to uh, call who they see fit for witnesses as they undertake this uh, this work thank you supplementary speaker I'm glad the government respects the work of the committee I'm just asking that they be helpful speaker if the premier hasn't done it already when will her or her staff be reaching out to the BC Liberals to ensure that Laura Miller can appear at the Justice Committee to give testimony Again, Mr. Speaker, the Justice Committee has the authority to invite uh, witnesses to come forward, and as any committee of this House, uh, there are steps they can take if they feel that uh, they're not getting cooperation from witnesses. So let's leave that, Mr. Speaker, with the Justice Committee. We've all had our share of frustrations, Mr. Speaker. As members know, uh, earlier in this session, there was a lot of frustration on our side because we wanted to hear from some of the candidates, Mr. Speaker, in the opposition parties, the candidates who went into the last election 
person making the exact same promise that the government made about the cancellation of the gas plants. We heard it from the PCs, we heard it from the NDP, that if they were elected, Mr. Speaker, they would undertake the exact same cancellation that we did. So, Mr. Speaker, there has been some frustration on this side of the House, but uh, again, Mr. Speaker, let's leave this with the committee. Thank you. Question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Speaker, for months we've seen article after article talking about an alleged trades tax being forced on skilled tradespeople across Ontario by the College of Trades. We've watched anti-college groups surface like Stop the Trades Tax Coalition. We've heard accusations even today from the opposition that the college is trying to put people out of work. And most recently, we are hearing allegations that the government is forcing compulsory certification on voluntary trades. Speaker, people are overwhelmed and confused by all this negative rhetoric around the College of Trades and want some answers. Through you, Speaker, Question. will the minister explain to the House whether there is any truth to these accusations? Thank you, Minister of Training, College of Trades. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank question. the member for asking such a direct question because I think we have to be very, very clear here. The membership fee that the College of Trades is, is uh, putting forward is the lowest membership fee of all the regulatory bodies across this province. What's it doing, Mr. Speaker? It's paying for the College of Trades to ensure that those hardworking, skilled tradespeople who go to school, who take an apprenticeship, who get their certificate of qualifications, are protected from the underground economy. That's important to those young people, Mr. Speaker. We want to build a skilled trade sector that's welcoming of young people, that gives them a career for life. That's one of the ways we're going to do that. Mr. Speaker, there's a number of other issues that the member uh, raised that's very, very important. Let's be very, very clear as well. The Ontario Coal— Answer. I'm going to have to answer that in the supplementary, yes, Mr. Speaker. I, think so. I can see you again. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that great answer and for standing up for Ontario skilled workers. I know people will be glad to hear that the province is standing up for skilled tradespeople, especially when the party opposite is not. And I look forward to continuing to help inform them on how they can become part of that process, unlike those that simply want to fight against it. Speaker, we've heard a lot today about the myths surrounding the college. Speaker, given that today is the one-year anniversary of the creation of the college, can the minister speak further on the important work of the College of Trades in, and what they are doing to help support skilled workers in Thank Ontario? Thank you, Minister. I, I certainly can, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to doing that, but I want to respond a little bit to the, the last part of her first question. Let's be very, very clear. The Ontario College of Trades and the Government of Ontario is not moving forward with compulsory certification for any trades. That's not something, Mr. Speaker, that we have the power to do. That's something that ought to be put through a proper process, which is what the Ontario College of Trades is there to do. I think it's important that that's clarified. Mr. Speaker, over the last year, what the College of Trades has been able to do is provide enhanced consumer protection so that when our grandmothers and mothers are going to, to the mechanic to get their brakes fixed, they know that a certified mechanic is there to fix their brakes. Mr. Speaker, they're providing a form of self-governance for the trades so the trades can make these decisions themselves. They're ensuring, Mr. Speaker, Answer. that young people have access to the trades and promoting the skilled trades, and they're protecting our hardworking skilled trades people to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that the qualifications that they have are respected. Earlier, I asked the member from uh, uh, Oxford to withdraw. I was mistaken, and I apologize to the member. If any other member wishes to stand to withdraw, I will accept that. <laughs> New question, the member from the PN Carlton. Thank you very much. Uh, speaker, my question is uh, to the Premier. Can the Premier tell us why Brianna Ames's computer was wiped? despite the fact she did not work in the Premier's office until she began working Good for the question. Premier herself. Oh. 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 These are staff 
Mr. Speaker, as I have said, there is an, an entirely independent investigation going on. I am not going to comment on that investigation, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, I think the I think the lead, the uh, member opposite knows that uh, that is the case. I have uh, I have answered questions, Mr. Speaker. We have provided documentation. We opened up the process, but the investigation that's going on is uh, independent, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, there is an investigation also uh, being done by the by the OPP today, and uh, they're probably going to be uh, bringing more people foo, foo, uh, uh, forward. Minister of the and Environment. I'm wondering if the Premier can tell us if any members of her transition team, or any members of her current staff, or any members of her cabinet are to be contacted as a result of an Ottawa citizen story by the OPP on this ongoing investigation. Could she please explain to the House if that's the case? Premier. Speaker, no, I, I can't. I can't uh, tell the uh, Leader of the Opposition what the uh, OPP investigation is going to uh, yes. uh, do over the next uh, period of time, Mr. Speaker, because it is an independent investigation, Mr. Speaker. It is independent from government. I heard of the allegations on March 27th. The allegations are against the former Chief of Staff of the former Premier, Mr. Speaker. It has nothing to do with the staff member that, uh, that you mentioned, Mr. Speaker, and the fact is that, um, you know, I believe that it really is unfair for the member opposite to drag uh, staff members' names in here when there is an independent uh, investigation going on, Mr. Speaker. I think that all of us should let that investigation run its course. Thank you. Your question. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Standing Committee on General Government is currently reviewing the Pan Para Pan Am Games. This review was struck in order to get to the bottom of all costs and to bring together all the fragmented pieces in the hope of clarifying responsibility and costs for the Games as a whole. Yet, the work of the committee members has been restricted from investigating the full scope of the Games and something as fundamental as security. Speaker, does this Premier agree that the scope of the committee should be so restricted? I mean, House Leader. And House Leader. Mr. So Speaker, I think the honourable member needs to be very careful. The work that is being undertaken by the committee is based on a motion that was passed by the committee, by all members of the committee on November 4th, which outlines the uh, framework in which the committee will work. I understand, Mr. Speaker, that the chair of the committee made an independent ruling. That is a ruling by the chair that has nothing to do with any party in this House. It is the chair Finally, looking at procedural uh, work that's gone forward. So, Mr. Speaker, I think it should be very careful. The committee's work, which is being undertaken, as I say, is based on the determination of the committee. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I would remind the member that there are other committees of this legislature who are looking at the Pan Am issue, including, Mr. Speaker, yes, the Public Accounts Committee, which has asked the Auditor General specifically to look into the security matters. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, obstruction is a wonderful word. Speaker. In spite of the restrictions, we found out yesterday that $239 million embarked for security is only an estimate. In other words, we have no guarantee that the costs will not continue to skyrocket, nor that we'll get the best value for the security costs. After a question period today, Speaker, I'll be moving a unanimous consent motion that will finally sh allow the committee to do their work and look at the whole picture. Speaker, will this Premier show that she really wants transparency, accountability and clarity and say now that she will support this motion? Mr. Speaker, these are the most open and transport multi-sport games ever. The government brought the Games Organizing Committee of TO uh, 2015 under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. I know that the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games is holding regular briefings, Mr. Speaker, for the media and interested members of the public. We have been forthcoming to uh, the various committees. As I say, the Public Accounts Committee is specifically looking into the security issue. In in terms of the, the member's uh, unanimous consent uh, uh, motion that he's put forward, I think he would agree that this is a matter that should be dealt with by House leaders, that we don't uh, interfere in what's going on in committees, Mr. Speaker, through a UC motion on the floor of the House. So, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the committee's mandate was yes, confirmed by the committee on November 4th. There are a number of committees looking into this matter. We have been very, very open and transparent. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. But with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I would love
like to congratulate Dr. Philippe Couillard, a premier elect of Quebec. 21, the Leaves to Help Families Act was debated in the legislature. I spoke on, my, on uh, behalf of my constituents, but we were somewhat dismayed, Speaker, to witness the opposition put up speaker after speaker, possibly to drag out the clock. It's a bill that all parties support, a bill about compassion, and yet every day, every day the bill is stalled further. Speaker, Ontarians with a family member with a serious medical condition are missing out on the time they may be able to spend with their loved ones. Critically ill children, individuals who have federal funding who might struggle financially, unable to access it as a provincial worker, Question. and families whose children, in fact, have been murdered or have gone missing. All of these individuals are affected. So, Speaker, to the Minister. What can we collectively do as members to make sure thank this you. legislation passes quickly? Thank you, Minister Lever. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the fine member from Etobicoke North for that question. Our government recognizes the importance of giving families the time to be with their loved ones yeah, yeah. and the other positive effects that this bill can have on the lives of everyday Ontarians. Absolutely. That's why on this side of the House, we're doing everything we can to move this bill through the legislature. Yeah, yeah. But with respect, Speaker, the opposition parties are needlessly extending debate on Bill 21. Listen to this, Speaker. This bill has been in the House for over a year, wow. 14 different days, 22 hours of debate. 75 speakers. Listening to the debate, it's been clear the majority of members in this House support this bill. This signals there's no true desire to have further meaningful debate on this bill, and their only goal is to delay. I'm calling on the opposition parties to stop stalling. Help us Thank pass you. this legislation. Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, as you said, we certainly respect all members' democratic right to speak on behalf of their constituents. That's their right as well as their duty. But a bill that's being delayed, dragged out, filibustered, that has a direct impact on the lives of many Ontarians, including residents in my own riding of Etobicoke North, that is not, I think, the best path forward. We had representatives from the Ontario Caregiver Coalition, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, Service Employees International Union, Canadian Cancer Society, and the Ontario Home Care Association, all of whom have, are on record as wanting this bill passed expeditiously. Absolutely. Speaker, yet we still watch an opposition talk about the Million Jobs Plan, other unrelated bills, while engaging what can only be charitably called debate. Speaker, can the minister please inform this chamber what has been the progress on this bill to date? Merci, Mr. Thank, you. Thank you. Speaker, minister. thank you again to the fine member from Etobicoke Centre for that question. As I mentioned in the last response, the opposition has had ample time during second reading to discuss any possible concerns or amendments that they, uh, they may have. Again, the bill's been in the House for over a year. Yeah. 14 different days, 22 hours of debate, 75 speakers. We've had two full days of committee, Speaker, where there were public hearings and amendments were made. This is not the time to debate new amendments to the bill. Remember from I Kitchener, believe it's Waterloo, disrespectful to, to everyone that could be helped in the province of Ontario by the passage of this legislation yeah, yeah. for the opposition to continue this irresponsible filibustering. Yeah, yeah. When we voted on this as a whole in committee, Bill 21 received all party support, and it was asked to be reported back to the House. The member for Kitchener, Waterloo. It's time to Come stop to using this important bill Answer. that's going to help people to play politics. Let's get the bill passed. We need the opposition to start showing their support for this. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. People of Wellington, Halton Hills, who are closely watching what's happening in this legislature, no doubt were startled to read the Toronto Star on March the 28th. No less than eight pages on the gas plant scandal, including a bombshell allegation that the former Premier's Chief of Staff might face criminal charges for arranging the deletion of internal government emails relating to the cancellation of the Oakville and Mississauga gas plants. The Toronto Star reported that an outside person was given access to 24 computers in the Premier's office during the transition between the McGuinty and Wynn Liberal governments just over one year ago. This is what was in the Toronto Star. With all that's happened on this file and the recent Toronto Star disclosures, how on earth does the Premier expect the people of Ontario to give her the benefit of the doubt? Yeah. 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 
Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I, I appreciate the fact that the, the honourable member was, was quoting from the media. I'd like to just remind him uh, what the media reviews have been about the performance of his party and, in particular, his leader on this file. From the Toronto Star, the publication that he quoted, the leader of the opposition went far beyond what the facts right. show. April 1, 2014. The leader of the opposition, another quote from the same date, is inventing fanciful scenarios about the first days of Wynne's premiership. Ottawa Citizen, April 1st. The PCs asked repeatedly whether Wynne's computer was among those wiped, which makes little sense. The police are crystal clear that they're interested in computers in McGuinty's office where Wynne did not work. A Globe and Mail editorial, April 1, 2014, on progressive Conservative leader Tim Hudak is on thin legal ice. Globe and Mail editorial, April 1st, the leader of the opposition's claim that Premier Wynne was personally behind any wiping of government computers. I'll continue. Supplementary. The government is quick to point out that the possible criminal breach of trust took place before the member for Don Valley West was sworn in as Premier. By taking this approach, they throw their former leader, Mr. McGuinty, unceremoniously under the proverbial bus. The government would also want us to overlook the fact that the day that the member for Don Valley West was elected leader of the Liberal Party in January of 2013, she became the incoming Premier. As incoming Premier, the power and authority and trust of inherent in that high office immediately began to shift to her. She can hardly claim that she has no responsibility for the transition period while blaming everything on the predecessor whose leadership she was proud to endorse through three provincial elections. How in good conscience Question. will she continue to blame all this on Dalton McGuinty? Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, we had the OPP appear in front of the committee, and they told us two things. First of all, that this is directed towards the former Premier's Chief of Staff, and the second is that MPPs should stay out the from of this, uh, come to order. police investigations. Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, I am pleased, I am proud of the fact that the Premier is seeking legal advice in this matter, and Mr. Speaker, we look to the opposition to apologize and retract their statements. As I said, Mr. Speaker, there their critic, the member from Nepean Carlton, has experience in it, and I quoted yesterday, Mr. Speaker, from this news release of January 31st from the member from Nepean Carlton, said, we are sorry for the negative perception that may have been created in terms of her uh, allegations against uh, uh, Murphy Macon, uh, Ms. Uh, Maureen Murphy Macon and Rick Morgan for wrongfully implicating them in an erroneous story in January 2004 yes, revolving oh. around the decision by former PC leader oh. Peter McKay not to seek the leadership of the new Conservative Party of Canada. You. She apologized then, Mr. You. Speaker. And we look for Thank the you. Now. New question. The member from Tamiskami uh, Cochrane. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Northern Development Mines. Last week, the government announced that it was keeping Ontario Northland public. Oh. But at the same time, in the same amount, announcement, said it was selling Ontario, the oh. communications arm of the ONTC, the one part of the ONTC that actually isn't costing the government any money. Wow. The sale to Bell Alliant is for $6 million, but the fiber optic ring alone that, that Ontario owns is worth $23 million. Oh, on top of that, on top of that, it will cost the government an estimated $60 million to transfer Ontario to Bell Alliant, and 100 jobs will be lost. Why does this government keep signing bad deals and letting Ontarians pay the tab? Mr. Speaker, and certainly I was very, I was very pleased to be in North Bay last week to announce, um, after a, a, a year of very hard and thoughtful work by a minister's advisory committee and a, a, a very thorough internal examination of a number of reports, including a, a management union options report, that indeed uh, uh, the province is keeping the uh, ONTC motor coach bus uh, division, the Polar Bear Express, rail freight and refurbishment.
services in public hands, something that, that would not have happened a year ago without the great work of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. We're making new strategic investments. Uh, as the member knows, uh, $6.2 million uh, to, uh, to purchase uh, 11 new accessible motor coaches uh, for the bus line, $17 million for the Answer. services. Certainly, I look forward to speaking to the, uh, the one line that indeed we did make a different Thank decision you. on in the supplementary. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, to the Minister of Northern Development Mines. Ontario is an integral part of the ONTC. It's part of the package. This government is paying a private corporation to take over a publicly owned business. This deal will cost jobs in Northern Ontario. And it begs the question, is this government really long-term committed to the ONTC, or is it just selling it off or dismantling it bit by bit? Thank you, Minister. I really think the member might want to be careful about undermining the uh, very good work of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. I mean, obviously, uh, Mayor Al McDonald of North Bay, uh, Alan Spatchett, the President of Phnom, Mayor Nina Walsh of Englehart, uh, Mayor Lochran of Timmins. They worked very, very hard, and indeed, the decision to keep those four lines in public hands was important. What needs to be said about the decision on Terry was it was indeed a difficult decision for, for us to make, but certainly for me as Minister to make. But I think there have been tremendous changes in the uh, telecommunications industry. I think it really ultimately came down to the fact that, indeed, I don't think it really makes sense anymore for a, uh, a telecommunication company that's in direct competition with the private sector uh, to continue to be supported by the government. The proceeds of the sale are, indeed, $6 million in cash, $10 million of financial line, and what you're not mentioning is, is the Bell Line will, will be providing $15.1 million in capital investment, Thank which you. will, indeed, match. The sale is in a second Thank you. part of... Uh, I stand, you sit. The member from Vaughan, new question. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is to the Minister of Consumer Services. Minister, eight out of ten citizens own some type of mobile device in Ontario today. In my own community of Vaughan, I've heard from many residents who have issues with their cell phone contracts. Many find the language used in these contracts difficult to understand, and they also have concerns about unexpected additional charges to their monthly bills and large cancellation fees if they try to get out of a contract. And that's why, Speaker, I was delighted to hear that the new Wireless Services Agreements Act came into effect at the beginning of April 2014. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House regarding how this act will provide better protection for consumers in Vaughan and across Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Government Services, or uh, Consumer Services. From Vaughan for this question. I'm very pleased to talk about the Wireless Services Agreement Act now in Forest, Ontario. I'd also like to give a shout out to the Minister of Natural Resources, the MPP from Sault Ste. Marie, for all his tireless work on this before I pick up the file. Thank you so much. And as noted by the member from Vaughan, there's been an explosion in the use of wireless devices. However, unfortunately, Speaker, there's also been an explosion in complaints about contracts for wireless services. And we understood this issue and we led the way for better consumer protection in Ontario. And because of our swift action, consumers in Ontario can now expect clear information, fewer surprises when they enter a cell phone and wireless service contract. As of April 1st of this month, Speaker, the requirements under this Act must Answer. be applied to all new contracts. So now people can expect plain contracts, a uh, clear outline of fees charge, and a cap on cancellation thank you. fees. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister and also, as she mentioned, echo her comments regarding the current Minister of Natural Resources for his long standing advocacy on this particular issue. Speaker, I am pleased to hear that consumers in Ontario will now be better protected under this Act. And I know that many in my community of Vaughan will feel more confident regarding entering into contracts for their wireless devices. Confident consumers result in a much stronger marketplace, Speaker, and this leads to a stronger economy. And I want to ensure that residents in my community who use their mobile devices for their jobs and to stay connected with their families at home are also protected by this act. Speaker, through you to the minister, are there options available to consumers who believe that their contract was not properly made or for those who feel that they are paying for services that they did not contract for? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, there are provisions to address uh, the concerns a member has raised. Under our new law, Speaker, service providers who do not comply with the rules must provide consumers who cancel their contracts a full refund for up to a year of service. 
If a provider charges for services after a contract is improperly amended, Ontario consumers are entitled to get that money back. Most importantly, we've enshrined the rights of consumers, and I'd add strong enforcement provisions as well, Speaker, when dealing with a wireless service con contract. We have legislation, not a code. This ensures consumers have a law they can refer to when utilizing and uh, dealing with service providers. Pro protecting consumers and helping people in their everyday life is part of our government's economic plan Answer. that is creating jobs for today and tomorrow. Our plan is focused on Ontario's greatest strengths, people and strategic partnerships, and our plan is working, Speaker. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. It's nice that she was able to join us for question period this morning. I, uh, I suppose, though, that when you're as deeply embroiled in scandal and have as many senior Liberals under OPP investigation as the Premier has, that ducking the cameras and the hard questions here in question period is probably the only strategy that she actually has left. Yeah. You're hiding behind lawyers, you duck question period to me and to the NDP and to the majority of people in Ontario, you're clearly a government that's on the run. Yeah. Well, my question is this, how much time have you spent since you're on the taxpayer's dime, consulting your lawyers when you actually should have been doing the job as Premier of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, you know, I appreciate the question from the member opposite. And I would ask him to join me any day, any week, and follow me, Mr. Speaker, to the events I go to, Mr. Speaker, to the people I connect with. I start my run at about six o'clock in the morning, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to have you there. I usually finish my last uh, meeting with folks around 10 o'clock, and in between is packed, Mr. Speaker. So I would be happy to have any of the members opposite come with me through my days, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation, uh, Premier. Uh, there was nobody at your event yesterday, so I can understand why you'd like to have some company. Uh, I know the, uh, the Premier doesn't like being compared to, uh, to Richard Nixon. The only thing she's missing, actually, is that big green helicopter on the south lawn here at Queen's Park. She employed one of the central figures in the gas plant scandal only until his name appeared in the press, and many McGuinty staffers have actually been promoted under her watch. But she wants us all to believe, Mr. Speaker, that she knew nothing, and these are just coincidences. And if you don't agree with what she says, then you get served by the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham and Howe. Premier, you're just not up to the job. You're more interested in complaining to lawyers than making hard decisions. Question. Then you, we, we should be creating jobs and balancing the books in Ontario. How many other taxpayer resources are you using for your Thank personal you. legal drama that's playing out here? Consumer, please. Consumer, please. Premier, government house leader. No, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to apologize and retract. As I said, and I, I got cut off earlier, let me tell you about a company or an organization, BlueDraft.com. It was a blog that was run in part by the member from Nepean Carlton. Oh, what and she say? had to put forward this statement January 31, 2005. The operators of BlueDraft.com, Ms. Lisa McLeod, of course, a member from Nepean Carlton, and Chris Fry.
Taggart would like to sincerely apologize to Maureen Murphy-Macon and Rick Morgan for wrongfully implicating them in an erroneous story in January 2004 revolving around the decision by former PC leader Peter McKay not to seek the leadership of the new Conservative Party of Canada. We are sorry for the negative perception that may have been created since then and, and may have harmed the solid reputation and high integrity of both Ms. Murphy-Macon and Mr. Morgan. We admit that our sources Thank you. were not reliable and proper Thank accuracy you. and verification procedures were not followed. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Deal with funding shortfalls as well as outdated and overcrowded facility. They considered the merger but had to back off because impacts on patient care thanks to lack of funding from this government. Hospital management, physicians, staff and patients continue to tell this government how desperate their hospital are in needs of repairs and upgrade. But now, instead of helping, Liberals MPP in the Scarborough area are blaming the hospitals. Will this government stop pointing fingers and tell the people of Scarborough what is their plan to fix their well-documented problems? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question. And I can tell you that I have met with my colleagues from Scarborough on a number of occasions because they are, they are working together to improve health care in Scarborough for the people of Scarborough and, uh, and Durham. Uh, I'm not sure where the member opposite is getting her information, but I can, I can assure you that the hospitals, the Lynn, in working with our MPPs, are determined to improve care for people in Scarborough today and in the future. Speaker, we know that in Scarborough, hospital infrastructures are falling apart. While emergency rooms are grossly undersized for the number, ever-growing number of patients that they serve, the Scarborough community feels that they're being given second-class treatment as health resources are being funneled to other areas of Toronto. And now that Liberals and MPPs have started to point their fingers at the hospital as the cause of the problem, it seems like any hope of improvement will once again be lost. Will this government tell the people of Scarborough whether they are prepared to stop playing games, prioritize patients' care, and fix the problem with the hospital infrastructure in Scarborough. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Speaker, I would be more than happy to uh, sit down with a member, as we have done before on other issues, to actually go through what is happening in Scarborough, because the Lynn and the hospitals are having productive conversations about how to uh, to respond to what is admittedly a need in Scarborough. So, uh, Speaker, uh, uh, the uh, MPPs. I, I really have to stress this. MPPs from Scarborough and Durham have been working very hard to find positive, constructive solutions that uh, uh, will uh, will mean better care for people in that area of the province. Thank you. New question. The member from York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Creating jobs and retaining jobs is one of our government's highest priority. And in order to do so, we need to make Ontario a good place to invest for industrial companies. And access to reliable electricity infrastructure, I understand, is the highest priority for large industrial electricity consumers, according to the Manufacturing Competitiveness Committee of the Canadian Automotive Partnership Council. Over the last 10 years, our government has made unprecedented investments in electricity transmission, distribution and generation, and as a result, we now have clean, reliable and affordable systems. Now that Ontario can provide reliable electricity, energy costs are one of the next Question. inputs that the industrial companies will need to factor in when considering whether to expand and create facilities in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you please tell Thank this you. House how we can help Ontario's companies? Minister of Energy. Speaker. Uh, first of all, Correction. I thank the member from uh, York Southwestern for the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Industrial Electricity Incentive Program is helping industrial companies in Ontario grow and create jobs. Under this new program, eligible companies qualify for some of the lowest electricity rates in North America if they expand an existing facility or build a new one in the province. Last week in Pembroke, 
I announced that Pembroke MDF paperboard plant was reopening using this program, creating 140 direct jobs plus many indirect jobs. In Whitby, Atlantic Packaging is upgrading their mill and creating 80 jobs, Mr. Speaker, using the IEI program. And in the members' riding of York Southwestern, the IEI program is helping Irving Tissue Answer. modernize and increase production capacity at their tissue mill. That's very good news. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. Helping industrial companies grow and compete in the global marketplace is an important part of our government's plan to create and support jobs for the citizens of Ontario. And it is excellent news that Irving Tissue, one of the largest employers in my community, is expanding and modernizing their tissue mill. I understand that in addition to programs like the Industrial Electricity Incentive, Ontario's updated long-term energy plan also reduces electricity costs for typical large industrial consumers by $3 million over the next five years and by $11 million over the next 20 years. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could he share with this House how the IE program, IEI program sorry, provides additional benefits Question. And how many jobs phase two of the program has helped create across the province? Good. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is indeed good news for job creation. Uh, Detour Very Gold good. says the program will save them $20 million in 2014 while they expand what is expected to be one of the largest gold mines in Canada. ASW Steel in Welland is creating 45 new jobs. I was there. Gold Corp is expanding the Muscle White Mine in Red Lake, and Resolute Canada will open a new sawmill manufacturing facility in Atacoka. Mr. Speaker, across the uh, province, more than 350 direct jobs uh, in mining, steel, and pulp and paper sectors are being created from projects accepted into this is new program, Mr. Speaker. In addition to creating jobs, the program benefits the electricity system by helping the province better manage its supply situation. And, sir. and because the IEI program is designed to take advantage of existing generating capacity, it will not have an impact on the costs for current electricity consumers, and it will take Thank some you. of the steam out of the opposition. Thank you. The member for the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to expand the scope of the review of the TO 2015 Pan Para Pam Am Games in the Standing Committee on General Government to ensure that every aspect of the games, including security, is able to be fully addressed during committee hearings. The page, please. You get this right. <laughs> Mr. Miller is seeking unanimous consent to expand the scope of the review of the TO 2015 Pan Parapan American Games in the Standing Committee of General Government to ensure that every aspect of the games, including security, is able to be fully addressed during committee hearings. Do we agree? I heard a no. The member on Granville for on a point of order. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with the House's indulgence, I just uh, want to introduce uh, a longtime uh, councillor in the uh, township of Elizabethtown, Kitley, and uh, a wonderful director of the OFA in uh, Leeds County, Eleanor Renault. Welcome. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 122, an act respecting collective bargaining in Ontario school system. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell.
Could all members please take their seats? All members take their seats, please. On April 7th, Ms. Sandals moved third reading of Bill 122. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Ma Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Charles. 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 Mr.